Uh, so uh, welcome everyone to the, the Q&A session, live, obviously live Q&A session. Thanks to uh, Seth, Mick and, and Keshav uh, for, the, um, for the talks. We don't have much time, so I guess I'll just dive straight in into some questions. So uh, a question for you, Seth. Um, could you describe in a bit more detail how phenomic selection yield based predictions can be adapted to more variable environments and used to predict the future environmental scenarios? Sure. Uh, I, I put a little answer in the chat, but I think there's three really, three really big ways. So, um, so the observations we're taking already include the environmental effects in which they're in which they're grown. So those are probably more translatable than some genomic aspects. But what's really cool is we can observe things in real time. So we can observe how the plants are interacting with uh, in response to temperature. So I didn't really show that, but uh, a recent study that we haven't submitted yet, um, we actually can detect a heat shock protein gene that comes on and off in response to the temperatures increasing uh, in our fields. And then finally, um, you know, I think in the past, everybody's worried about uh, or used crop growth models that have been parameterized with these really labor intensive estimates of going out in the field. And so they reduce the number of genotypes and reduce the number of environments. And so what we're looking at now is parameterizing uh, crop growth models um, using you know, many more environments and many more uh, diverse genotypes. And so those will be able to be useful in prediction, just like regular crop models. At least I think so. OK, well, th th thanks a lot for that. Um, I guess one question that um, came to my mind and perhaps other people's minds is the cost, cost differential between genomic selection approach and a phenomic selection approach. So it depends really on the on the phenotype that's being uh, assessed. But uh, can you give uh, some ideas from some of your examples that, with respect to a cost, cost differential? Is that to everybody or anyone? Oh, I guess to, to you, yeah. OK, um, so for my program, um, you know, I decided a long time ago I didn't want a lab, so we outsourced genomic work. Um, I'd say the amount of effort and time to collect tissue needs to be factored in. Uh, genomic work actually has been the limiting factor in every single one of our studies. So we have far more phenomic data. Um, you know, a DJI Phantom costs four uh, costs about uh, four thousand uh, dollars, give or take. You know, with the multi spec, maybe ten thousand dollars, and then somebody to fly it. Uh, it only takes a couple hours, you know, per day. Um, so our phenomic work is far cheaper than our genomic work. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, uh, just moving on to to Mick. Uh, and uh, I guess I had a question with respect, I mean, it was some beautiful images there and, 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 the, and the models being generated, I guess, uh, examples with Arabidopsis initially and then and brassica crops. Uh, I'm assuming that the modeling would work across um, all brassica species, but are you actually looking at other crops as well? Um, cereals or uh, pulse crops like lentils? Um, yeah, part of that work actually already modeled uh, maize plants, just the vegetative growth of maize, because it's uh, it was a little bit simpler to uh, calibrate instead of uh, this uh, highly branching architecture of canola. So we showed that uh, you can calibrate a maize model in the same way on uh, this lemon tech data set, and then use those calibrations of synthetic plants to train a neural network to count leaves and then apply it to the, uh, to the actual images. Um, so those are those are the two, yeah. So Arabidopsis, maize, and canola are the main ones. We are definitely want to keep going, and uh, I think the next plant to look at is Brassica race, another Brassica, but Brassica race, yeah. Okay, that thanks. Uh, just coming back to you, uh, Seth. There's a, a question here from An Andrea Todd. Uh, uh, do you see using these phenomic selection tools? to also monitor fields, uh, to adjust watering or fertilizer levels in real time as we can see the plants reacting. Yeah, so um, I don't really see that uh, happening for row crops. I just don't think it's economically feasible. The companies that have been flying this large acreage say they have trouble making money doing it. Um, we already do see a little bit of that in high value crops like uh, grapes and apples. Um, but I think really where the future is, is fusing this data with uh, actual satellite data because satellite data is it's not free, but it's it's much less expensive. And so um, there have been some groups at Washington State and and uh, and James Schnabel at University of Nebraska Lincoln who have been working on fusing that data. So for producers, that's probably going to be more economic than actually flying a drone over all their fields. But the things we discover with the drones in our breeding program, I think, are directly translatable uh, to those remote sensing measures through satellites. 
Okay, thanks. Um, and Keshev, I, I guess you, you articulated some of what you're doing on the hyperspectral side of things. And uh, I guess one question I had there is, is the amount of data that, that, that's being generated with that, that platform. Um, uh, in, in terms of uh, the utility of, of that approach, uh, uh, is, is it something that could be, uh, can, can, can be deplo deployed effectively, especially if you're, if you're going to be doing um, uh, uh, collecting data throughout a growing season? How practical is it to, to use the, the hyperspectral in that context? Yeah, I understand, Andrew, your um, question about. So we need to accept some of the reality, like some of the traits is always possible by normal RGB and multispectral data. Multispectral data. And we need to bring the hyperspectral utility because each band of hyperspectral carries some information. So how we can retrieve all those information coming from the hyperspectral signals, although the hyperspectral data is always uh, like bulky and having more different protocols in terms of calibration and processing step. So it's, it's always viable to think about what is our, our objective and work on those objectives. So either is uh, is basically uh, is, is hard to achieve by normal RGB multispectral. We need to shift to the hyperspectral uh, hyperspectral data for that. Like one of the uh, board maturity kind of thing is a, is a very physiological traits than a physical traits. So so that's kind of the work we need to. Uh, need to work by using the hyperspectral data throughout the season, uh, having a different time point so that we can discrete out not uh, taking the uh, images uh, or, or the data set every uh, twice or thrice in a week. We can discrete out and limit our important flight days throughout the season. And on the basis of we can reduce our data, uh, like like um, amount of the data, and then work on the data set in terms of mostly how we can going through the calibration and how we can treating the data to uh, get out the objective. So, so there's a different pro process and cons of, uh, of these all different platforms I can see. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, thank, thanks, Keshav. Uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to stop the Q&A session now. As a, as a, obviously, some other questions have come through uh, as well. And there will be an opportunity for networking, uh, I think at lunchtime and um, towards the end of the day as well. So if people have other, other questions they want to ask, uh, then please uh, go into those uh, sessions and you'll be able to chat with Seth, Mick and, and Kesha. Uh, and I think some questions have already been answered, uh, particularly by Seth in the, uh, in the chat line. So um, with that, I'll, uh, I'll, we'll have to sign off now and, and hopefully you can join the next session, the Cutting Edge Molecular Technology session, which starts in, well, in a sec one second. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Uh, uh, and thanks, Seth, Mick, and Kesha. Really appreciate it. Good time.